Okay, in this module we get started with industrial instrumentation and this will should only be four modules when we're done. Uh, in this module we'll talk about temperature and how to make temperature measurements and transmit these temperature measurements and how to calibrate our transmitters. Then we'll discuss pressure. Now we talked about pressure under thermodynamics and fluid mechanics for process control. So if you're not real familiar with uh, pressure you should go back and study these modules again. Uh, we'll talk about how to take pressure measurements and pipes and vessels and how this works. Uh, then we'll talk about level and how to measure levels. Okay, well, when we're measuring a level, it might be a head measurement. It may be radar, ultrasonic. There are different ways to measure level. And we'll try to discuss all these different ways and how to calibrate for these level measurements. And we're going to talk about specific gravity and how specific gravity affects our level measurement. It's very important we understand how specific gravity affects these measurements. Okay, now we're into temperature. Let's get started. So, how are temperature measurements made? Well, some are made with a liquid like you see here. Some are made with gas or vapor like you see here. And some may be electronic like an RTD or a thermocouple. Now we'll discuss the different kind of uh, temperature measurements in thermometers. Uh, there's different classes and then we'll talk about thermocouples and RTDs and how to use these. Okay. Now thermometers and their classification will probably only be on the CCST exams. You probably won't have these kind of questions on the CSE or the CAP, but it's good information to know. Uh, the rest of the temperature measurement will be on all exams. So, when we're looking at thermometers, there's four classes. The first class is liquid field, other than mercury, and it works by volumetric expansion. The second class is vapor field, and it works by pressure generation. Just like in thermal, when it heats up, uh, the molecules become more radical and they expand out. The third is gas field. You can use gas in the thermometer, and again, it works on pressure generation. And then the fourth, and the most popular, is a mercury field, which it works on volumetric expansion itself. Okay, if you ever break a mercury thermometer, it's important to know that uh, you're not supposed to clean it up and throw it away. You're supposed to call a fire department or some kind of HAZCOM unit to dispose of your mercury. Because of mercury poisoning, it is important that HAZCOM takes care of this and disposes of it properly. Okay, here we're showing uh, the four major types of electronic temperature measurement. The thermocouple, the RTD, the thermistor, and the IC sensor. Okay, the thermocouple is two dissimilar metals put together, and it's called the laws of intermediate metals. And we're going to look at that in a minute. That's what we're going to do next is thermocouples. Then we're going to look at RTDs. An RTD is just what it says. It's a resistance temperature detector. And it's a resistor, a precision resistor, that changes resistance proportional to the temperature. And if you look at this chart, you'll see it kind of flattens out on the end. That's because you can only read so far into the temperature range, and then you reach your maximum resistance, and the resistance doesn't really change that much anymore. So it's limited to how far into the temperature range you can measure. A thermistor has a really steep curve, 
and it changes really steeply with the temperature. And there's two types of thermistors. There's an N coefficient and a P coefficient. With the P coefficient, it means the resistance goes positive as you increase the temperature. And with an N coefficient, it means the resistance decreases when you increase the temperature. So we're looking at an N coefficient here. Then an IC sensor is just a chip that's, that's made to measure a linear output for the temperature. Okay, here's a thermocouple. And as you can see, we just take two different kind of metals and we wrap them around and we make a junction. And both of these metals have a difference of voltage. Uh, you have a certain amount of electron volts per element. And so the iron will have a certain electron volts and the copper will have a certain electron volts. So we can measure a differential of voltage in millivolts across these two different type of metals. And when we put a meter in this, this is called the law of intermediate metals. And so as the temperature rises on this junction that's in the hot junction, uh, it increases the millivolts out. So the higher the temperature, the more millivolts it produces. And as the temperature rises, we can get a direct reading of what that temperature is by measuring the millivolts difference between the two metals. And so uh, they're showing this voltmeter connected to the thermocouple, but in reality at room temperature you'll never read anything. You have to add what's called a cold junction and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, when we assemble these thermocouples, we put them together, we put them inside a metal sheath to protect them typically. And this metal sheath, as you see here, uh, notice the tip of the two metals of the conductors are welded together and this is called ungrounded because it's not touching the sheath. The next one you weld them together and they touch right up to the metal sheath and this is called grounded. Uh, this gives you your fastest response but it's more susceptible to noise in the system. Uh, electrical straight currents will cause noise in your thermocouple and you'll get an erratic output. And then the third one is called exposed. It's just out in the open and we have a welded bead on the end. And uh, we typically have to insulate these. Uh, they'll put in bare wires inside these sheaths sometimes. And sometimes they'll, they'll have actually insulated wires. We'll put these in ceramic insulators, uh, some kind of insulation. Uh, but if you're going to be measuring a flare up near a really hot, uh, then you want to put this in ceramic insulation pellets because the insulation will melt and then they'll short out and you won't get a good reading. Okay, with the thermocouple, this junction joined together produces a voltage and it's called the Seebeck effect. So whenever you have a junction, it actually is a small battery and it actually generates millivolts. Instead of a big battery putting out volts, this puts out millivolts. So like at room temperature, you might have one and a half or two millivolts and uh, whenever you have a junction, you create a battery. So when we take our material, say it was a J-type thermocouple, iron and constantine, and we connect it to a copper wire, uh, we create a new battery, a new thermal junction. And what we want to do is, by keeping these at a reference temperature, we can tell what the voltage of that junction will be, and then we just subtract it from the voltage we're trying to get and we get an accurate measurement. So as you can see here on the top we can put it into an ice bath and then we can reference our temperature uh, for whatever we're trying to get. Of course you don't want to build an ice bath, you don't want anything stuck in ice so we build what's called electronic ice bath or a cold junction and the reference junction or cold junction actually subtracts the voltage from the uh, voltage of the source that you're heating. So if you look at this equation at the bottom, it says Vm voltage meter equals Vtc voltage at the thermocouple junction where you're heating it minus the voltage at the cold junction 1 plus cold junction 2 equals voltage thermocouple minus cold junction. All right, but uh, when we get into our um, say our temperature measurement device, a recorder, uh, something like this, uh, it's important to understand that this reference junction has to be referenced to the temperature of the building or where the measurement device is. 
and typically we'll put on like a 500 ohm reference resistor and this will tell us what the temperature is by measuring that resistance we know what the temperature is in the building so we can calculate an accurate temperature to subtract from this thermocouple. Now uh, most transmitters and recorders will take multiple types of thermocouples and these all have different voltages so they're going to produce different voltages at the cold junction or the reference and the factory will build lookup tables to look up what this voltage would be and through a menu select what type of thermocouple you have J, K, E, T, R, S and it'll compensate for it automatically. So don't forget to attach your 500 ohm reference resistor or whatever they have. Some won't have a reference resistor. Some will have a thermistor or some other type of a temperature compensation built into the electronics. But uh, most chart recorders will have a 500 ohm precision resistor to attach on the outside of the chart recorder. So on these exams, they may ask you the principles like the Seebeck defect, etc. And basically what a cold junction is. Uh, but only on the CSE will they say if you have a temperature at such and such, what is the millivolts uh, that this type of uh, thermocouple is producing. On the CCST exam, they may show a table of temperatures versus uh, millivolts and ask you to give the millivolts. That's possible. But remember, it's all computer based. So it's different for every type of thermocouple. So let's look at the different types of thermocouples. Okay, these are the four most popular thermocouple types you'll find in an industrial plant. Uh, it's J, K, E, and T. And if you look at the letters, it tells you what it is. Uh, your J will be black, K will be yellow, E will be purple, and T will be blue. Now, these are the positive leads. The negative lead is always red. For any thermocouple, the negative lead will be red color. Okay, so a J is good for 32 degrees to 1,382 degrees Fahrenheit, while a K is good to minus 328, clear up to 2,282 degrees Fahrenheit, and E is in the middle. It's from minus 328 degrees Fahrenheit to 1,652. Looking at the chart on the right, we can see what the millivolts are on the Y approximately compared to the degrees in Fahrenheit on the X axis. And we can see that these thermocouples are not very linear. They're kind of non-linear all over the scale. And uh, they basically they take care of this linearity pretty much with software and lookup tables. But um, an RTD in itself is very linear. So the next thing we'll look at is an RTD, and it's more of a precise temperature measurement. Now, if you're taking the CCST, Certified Control Systems Technician exam, uh, they're probably going to ask you, what is the makeup of the material of certain thermocouples? And again, we'll stick with most popular, J, K, E, and T. It wouldn't hurt to memorize these, like T is copper and constantine, and J is iron and constantine. So it doesn't hurt to dedicate these to memory before the exam. Now for those of you who are taking the CSE, the Control Systems Engineer exam, uh, we have all the tables you need in the book. Uh, we, we have the RTD tables in the back, and we have the millivolt tables for the different thermocouples in the back. And uh, you need to get this book and go through these work problems. Uh, you should work these problems with thermocouples and RTDs. Uh, this will give you an edge ready for the test. Uh, especially when we get to the RTDs. Uh, I'm not going to work the problem here, but they get kind of complex. I want you to take, uh, we have a measurement resistor. What is the ohms of that measurement resistor at a certain temperature? Or they'll say, we got it in a bridge and you have this differential voltage what is the ohms and the temperature of that RTD at that measurement on the bridge. Okay, now RTDs. And here we're looking at an industrial RTD on the left. And you can see the red wires. There's two red wires and a white wire inside. This means that this is a three-wire RTD. So if we look at our wiring diagram on the right-hand side and look at the top in the middle, uh, the top is for a single RTD in this metal sheathing, and the bottom is for two RTDs 
in the metal sheathing. And this is typically called a dual element RTD or thermocouple. In this case, an RTD. Uh, we'll see in the middle and the top that we have two reds and one white. Now, this is a resistor, so there's no polarity. It's just the way it attaches to the bridge. Uh, the two reds are the same. That's why they're the same color. Okay, if you got two whites, that's also the same wire. It's just the way it attaches to the bridge or the circuit. So the first one would be a two-wire RTD. The middle one is a three-wire RTD. And the last one is a four-wire RTD. And you'll see in a second, typically we'll use current uh, and then measure the voltage through the four-wire RTD. So uh, on the bottom, notice that if you've got two RTDs, uh, the second RTD is yellow and black or yellow and gray. And so that designates the difference between RTD1 and RTD2 inside the sheathing. Okay, here we're looking at applications of a 100 ohm platinum RTD table. Now, most RTDs are 100 ohm platinum, but there is different DENS. DENS is an acronym for the German Institute of Standardization. And it's similar to the American National Standards Institute. And so these set specifications for certain pieces of equipment. In this case, what type of RTD it is. And that would be the DIN rating of it. You can order a 100 ohm with different DINs. And that means that the resistance per Celsius changes differently with the DIN type. Uh, you can also get 10 ohm RTDs. And they're typically copper. So the 100 ohm will be platinum and the 10 ohm will be copper. But it's important to understand that these RTDs equal 100 ohms at 32 degrees Fahrenheit or 0 degrees C and 10 ohms on the copper at 32 degrees Fahrenheit or 0 degrees C. Uh, your resistance will change uh, per the DIN, but they always equal 100 ohms or 10 ohms at 32 degrees Fahrenheit or 0 degrees C. Down below it shows how to connect this measuring, temperature measuring RTD to the bridge. So the first will be a two wire. The second in the middle will be a three wire connection. And you notice at the bottom that the voltage is going out to the RTD and coming back to the bridge. So this helps cancel out voltage in the line. So it's a plus voltage one way, a minus voltage the other way, and when you add them together, they tend to cancel out the voltage drop in the line. And then uh, the last one is what they call a four-wire RTD. And typically today, uh, the four-wire has a constant current, typically 20 milliamps of driving current that flows through the RTD. And again, just like earlier, uh, E equals I times R. So we'll get a voltage that is proportional to the voltage drop across that RTD. And as the resistance changes in temperature, we just take that resistance of whatever it is at the time, times 20 milliamps to get a voltage, and we put that into a high impedance input analog to digital converter. And most of our transmitters today uh, are microprocessor based. They used to be analog circuits, but now most of them have microprocessors where you can trim the input and the output. So you have a analog to digital in and a digital to analog out and the microprocessor works on a data bus with a bit count. So with the 4 wire RTD, remember that the voltage is exactly directly proportional to the resistance of the measurement RTD and then the microprocessor will change that voltage into a current and you can calibrate the display as well. If you have one with a display, you can calibrate this display to show the temperature for that particular RTD. Uh, these housings also can have thermocouples and they work exactly the same. So if you had like a Rosemont 644, uh, you can connect up a two wire RTD, a three wire RTD, a four wire RTD, or a thermocouple and you just program the transmitter for which one you're going to use and it'll display the right temperature and it will put out the right 4 to 20 milliamps for whatever temperature range you've calibrated in. So you actually have to calibrate these for a temperature range 
that you want to measure. Now this 644, it could sit inside a housing that just has 4 to 20 coming out, or it could be in what you just saw where it has a display, a digital display. This looks like a piece of ceramic, but it's got a microprocessor and complex circuitry in it, and you communicate with it with the heart protocol and a communicator. It's digital, so you have to establish communications to calibrate and set the parameters on these uh, transmitters. So when we're calibrating, uh, if we look at this image right here, now notice this brown thing in the red line below the puck, below the temperature transmitter. It's actually a 250 ohm precision resistor. Uh, the resistor doesn't have to be precision, it just has to be a resistor. Uh, the heart communicator won't be able to communicate to the transmitter unless the loop has at least 250 ohms of resistance. That includes your calibrator, uh, your analog cards, uh, anything in the loop, as long as you have at least 250 ohms of resistance, the communicator can communicate to the transmitter to calibrate. And it's very important you have this. Uh, we'll discuss how this works when we get into industrial networking. We'll discuss the heart protocol and how it works. This is a thermocouple, and it's a K-type thermocouple. We know it's K because it's yellow and it's red. And so it's a thermocouple going in. And we can simulate the thermocouple by plugging it into a multifunction calibrator. And then we uh, send out the signal, which gives us a voltage proportional to the temperature. And we can calibrate that way. Uh, with an RTD, you just connect up to the RTD the same way. And it'll simulate an RTD for you. And you can calibrate for your temperature. Uh, the best way to do this, though, is to actually have the element. Uh, it comes up through the wires, come up through the center of the disc right there, a puck or a disc, and the wires come up and connect in. And then, as you see here on the left, it sits in the top of the housing. And then you put the stem, the sheathing, down inside what they call a hot box or a metrology well. A lot of times, these are referred to as a temperature bath. And typically, these uh, boxes will do refrigeration and heating. Uh, a typical flute may go to minus 45 C and up to 700 C. So these are great for getting actual calibration and verifying the calibration. Uh, when you go through a plant and you have to verify your calibration once a year, you can take these out and stick it into the box and see if it's actually working and verify the calibration compared to the standards that have been set and see if they're within tolerance. Now, when you're calibrating, it isn't always just the 0 and the 20 milliamp span you're trying to calibrate. Sometimes you have to adjust the 0, especially on pressure. And the way you adjust this 0 measurement is by doing what's called a digital trim. So you may have to go into the transmitter and adjust the digital trim on the analog to digital converter and adjust the 4 to 20 out on the digital to analog converter to make sure you're accurate on your output. Also, when you go into your PLC card, uh, it may be a little bit out of calibration. So you may have to calibrate it for the 4 to 20. You'll put a meter on there, and you'll put in 4 to 20, and make sure your bit count is what it's supposed to be for 4 to 20. All these errors add up. The resolution of the system, the performance of the system, is based on the sum of the errors. So we want to make these errors as small as we can. Uh, that way we have little error in our process control measurement and control system. Now in industrial processes, typically these thermocouples and RTDs go into what's called a thermal well. And what this is, is while the process is running, say the thermocouple or the RTD fails on you, uh, you need to be able to pull this out and replace it. So if we didn't have these thermal wells, our process fluid would pour it out everywhere or we'd have to shut down our process. So the thermal well gives you a hole. It's basically just a deep blower, just like, just like a drilling a well. It's a hole going down inside the process pipe, and it isolates the thermocouple from the process. And sometimes they'll put in antifreeze, and this will couple the uh, thermal well to the thermocouple sheathing and give you a faster response. Uh, sometimes they put it in dry, and it just sits in there. Uh, typically, these thermocouples and RTDs have a spring on the top, and the spring pushes down on the thermocouple sheathing to keep it tight 
uh, against the thermocouple well so you can get the best response you can get. Now these wells can be flanged. That means uh, we put a, a round ring with a hole in it and we bolt it on or it can be threaded so we just screw it into what's called a weld let fitting. Uh, it'd be like a coupling welded onto the pipe or the vessel or we may just actually put it in and weld it directly to the vessel. And so we can see this here. Now notice on the right we have uh, a thermal well on the top and the bottom has a thermal well already put on the transmitter so we can just screw it into a, a weldlet or a nipple. Uh, but in the middle that's just the sheathing. There's no thermal well there and that's what slips down inside the thermal well. Okay now a couple terms with thermal wells. This is called the extension. It's the part that sticks above or outside the pipe. This is the immersion. It's the part that goes into the pipe and how deep into the pipe. And typically you'd like to get your thermal well typically around the center of the pipe. Uh, that way you get the best temperature gradient. Now what we see at the top here is called tapered. It's a tapered thermal well. It slants down. The next one we have here is called stepped. Notice it comes down and it steps in. That way you got a thinner wall at the tip of your thermocouple. It gives you a better temperature measurement. And this one on the bottom here is called straight. The thermal well wall comes straight down. We've pretty much covered thermal wells now, so let's move on. Okay, we need to review pressure now and talk a little bit about the difference between PSI as being a force generated by molecules with brain of motion and molecules that are actually being accelerated by gravity and our weight. Both are measured in PSI but they have different applications and we're going to need to know the difference between these applications and process pipes, vessels, and when we get in the level we need to understand how gravity affects this PSI. So let's get started on that. Okay now remember uh, even though the fluid in a process pipe has weight, uh, we're not interested in the weight, we're interested in the static pressure and this pressure is made by molecules hitting against the side and bouncing off to accelerate, hit the side, generate a force and release that energy uh, in inertia and that energy into the metal into the sides of the pipe is called force and so force divided by area is pressure. We covered this thoroughly in fluids and thermal. So it doesn't matter if it's 60 degrees or 600 degrees it doesn't matter if it's uh, alcohol, honey, gasoline, oil, or water. They're just producing, these molecules are just producing a force against the side of the pipes. And so we put a pressure gauge on there to measure the static pressure to find out if it's too high or if we might rupture a gasket, blow out a gasket, uh, pop off a pressure relief valve. We can see what the pressure is to monitor our pressure. Okay, so if we look at this pressure gauge here on the right, we'll see down at the bottom it has a diaphragm and they'll call this a seal or a diaphragm. And this seal, again your molecules are just pounding against it. And basically this is filled with uh, typically a silicon fill or oil fill going up to the burned on tube in the uh, pressure gauge. And this is a mechanical amplifier or a mechanical repeater. It just repeats the pressure to the gauge so we can read this gauge. So there's certain applications like uh, if we're looking at NOx reductions and we have a catalytic converter and it's removing the NOx emissions and to do this we have to spray anhydrous ammonia. Well with an anhydrous ammonia system uh, according to DOT, Department of Transportation, when you bring this in you unload this anhydrous ammonia it says uh, for any kind of tank, vessel, or pipe, you can't have larger than a number seven hole, or you have to have a seal or an excess flow check valve. So in this case, we put something like you're looking at, a diaphragm or a seal type uh, pressure gauge or repeater to a transmitter. We use a seal type transmitter. And a number seven drill bit is basically a quarter inch hole. That's what you use to drill and tap for a quarter inch bolt hole. Okay, 
So here we're looking at some pressure gauge accessories. Uh, just like the previous pressure gauge on the right, this pressure gauge on the right has a seal. But instead of being bolted onto the pipe with a flange, uh, here you could just screw it into uh, what we call a weld outlet. We already talked about this. It's a little coupling and a threaded coupling, and they weld it onto the pipe. It's made to fit the pipe, and they call those weld outlets. Uh, so that has a seal in it right there, and you just screw it on, and that's it. But on steam pipes, the steam can get so hot, it can actually damage your pressure gauge. So what they do is they have this coil called a siphon tube, and as the steam comes up, it cools down, and that fills up with condensate. And this condensate helps block the steam uh, from going directly against it. And so these are typically called a pigtail. Uh, you typically see a pigtail out in the field. Talk about a pigtail when you're hooking up a pressure gauge to a steam pipe. Now, steam and other applications can have pulsations uh, like compressors. And this little device you're seeing up here at the top is a pulsation dampener. It's basically what it is, just an integrator. It has a small hole, and you have to integrate through time to take that volume up to that small hole. And it's adjustable, uh, some are. And so this will dampen the pulsation by making the pressure surge integrate through time into the capacitance of the pressure gauge. So this acts like a resistor, and the gauge acts like a capacitor. You get an RC time constant, and this actually is a frequency dampener. So only low frequencies can get through. Okay, another way of uh, dampening uh, a frequency is they have a liquid filled gauge. That means uh, underneath the glass of the gauge where the needle, the dial and the needle are, they actually fill that up with a viscous fluid. And it's not quite filled all the way, almost to the top. But that will dampen the needle movement itself. So the needle doesn't jerk and pound and keep shaking, 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 shaking. It's hard to read and eventually it'll break off. So they dampen this by putting in this viscous fluid and the needle can only move slowly. So you get a really nice uh, measurement and uh, there's not a lot of pulsations. Uh, let's take a look at this pressure gauge and the parts of the pressure gauge. Now in a process gauge, they're typically worried about safety. And so if something would fail in the pressure gauge, you know, it'd explode. We don't want the glass or anything flying out in our face. So typically they make these with a rear cover that will blow off or it has a blowout hole that blows out under pressure if something would fail. But basically what you're looking here in the middle, uh, you have your pipe tap come in from your well outlet. And uh, in process, we'd like to use a hand valve between our process pipe in our pressure gauge. So if the pressure gauge fails, we can unscrew it and remove it and replace it. So it's good uh, practice to put in a hand valve, a block valve, just a simple ball valve or a gate valve to block out our, our uh, pressure gauge. But where this uh, national pipe thread connection comes up, this is called a burned on tube. And it just works on the principle of stress, just like a diaphragm. Uh, as you put pressure Remember, pressure is energy per unit volume. So the more pressure we have, the more energy we put on it. And this energy, as you remember from fluids, is work per unit volume. So it does work on this, and force over distance is work. So it generates a force and starts pushing the burned-on tube up. It tries to straighten that burned-on tube out. And as it tries to straighten out that burned-on tube, uh, it's connected to what's right behind it, a rotary geared movement. And so this geared movement, uh, based on the movement of the burn-on tube, it's linked to the rotary geared movement, and the little shaft coming out of the front of the rotary geared movement is what goes into the pointer. You notice there's a face plate there, and it has gradients around it. And this could be uh, PSI, kilopascals, bar, feet of water. Uh, when you're measuring pressure, it doesn't matter what it is. Uh, you don't use specific gravity. It has nothing to do with it. It's strictly pressure. And you can use whatever scale you want to use. Um, and, of course, we have a ring here that screws into the front. And that's what keeps it all together. Okay, remember from Fluids for Process Control that there's basically three type of gauges and transmitters. Absolute, gauge, and differential. 
gauges the pressure above atmospheric pressure. Absolute is the atmospheric pressure, 14.7, and any gauge above atmospheric pressure. And differential pressure is just the difference of two pressures. So differential pressure can be used in flow, or differential pressure can be used across a tank or vessel that's pressurized. So what we're seeing here on the right is called an inline transmitter, and it can be ordered as gauge or absolute. You just put a G or an A in the number sequence to tell them which one you want. And these inline transmitters will be used to measure static pressure in a pipeline or in a tank. They can't measure flow because they can't measure a difference of head or difference of energy across an element. So they're strictly for a pipeline or a tank. The one on the left is a current transmitter. It uses a 4 to 20 current. You can get them on 1 to 5 volts, but typically you get a 4 to 20 milliamp current output. The one on the right uses the wireless heart protocol. And so it can either be two protocols, ISA 111A or the IEEE 802.15.4. And these are the typical protocols used for process control. And they're special. They use Ethernet, but it's a special Ethernet. And so normal gateways and routers can't communicate with them. You have to buy a special gateway router to be able to communicate with these uh, transmitters. Okay, here we're looking at uh, a transmitter on the left would be a flow transmitter. It's a differential. And the one on the right would be a gauge or an absolute transmitter. It only has one input. So a gauge or an absolute only has one input, while a differential has two, a high and a low side. So your upstream would go into your high side. And on this pressure transmitter on the right, uh, you only have a high side, and your low side is blocked or vented. OK. So OK, what we're seeing right here is called a valve manifold. And these tubes go into the valve manifold. And the manifold sits between the, the tubing to the process piping, which we call impulse lines, and the actual transmitter. And so the transmitter has a high side and a low side. So this is called a three-valve manifold because it has three valves. You see those three handles. There's also five-valve manifolds, and those will have five valves or five handles. So typically, you'll see the three-valve manifold. So the two valves on the horizontal on the ends uh, these block the high and the low side and isolate the transmitter from the process line. The valve in the middle, the handle in the middle, is what's called the equalization valve. It, you open it up slowly and it equalizes the pressure between the high and the low. Uh, once you block this, you can actually go in and calibrate the transmitter if you want. What you're looking at here is called a biplanar. If it, the tubes go in, to the transmitter, if the tubes go into the transmitter in a horizontal fashion, this is called biplanar. If the tubes come into the bottom and come through the bottom, this is called coplanar. Okay? Now, here we're looking at the end line again, and this is not coplanar, uh, even though it comes in from the bottom. Coplanar and biplanar are for transmitters that have two inputs, a high and a low, uh, differential, or they could have two inputs, but they blocked off one to make it absolute or gauge pressure. Okay, but this does have something unique I want you to look at. It's a two-valve manifold, and this inline transmitter would go through this manifold, and if you look closely, on the left, the blue tag says isolation, and on the right, the red tag says vent, and you'll see a little plug on the back, and that's the vent. And this allows you to isolate the transmitter from the line, open up the vent, and then calibrate your gauge by putting pressure in there to check your calibration or recalibrate the range. Now, these transmitters can be ordered in different ranges. Say is a Rosemont uh, 3051. If it was uh, had in the designation 1A, that would be, that is not absolute, uh, before this, we'll get a D, G, or A being differential gauge or absolute, but this is a pressure range, and if it's a 1, 
it's uh, minus 25 to 25 inches. Uh, if it was an absolute, it would be 0 to 30 PSIA. Uh, a range 2 would be minus 250 to plus 250 inches H2O. But if it was an absolute, it would be 0 to 150 PSIA. And if we had a differential that had a range 3, that would be minus 1,000 to 1,000 inches H2O. And if that was an absolute, it would be 0 to 800 PSIA. So as you can see, these ranges set different values. You need to know what range you're buying for your application when you order these. So basically, you calibrate a pressure transmitter the same way you calibrate the temperature transmitter. Uh, we get our communicator with our 250 ohm resistor, and we hook up our communications. And then we'll take a process meter or an ammeter with a um, power supply, and we connect it in series. Now, you can hook that power supply directly across that plus or minus, and it won't short out. That transmitter is a current regulator. It regulates 4 to 20 milliamps based on your calibration range. So you can never short it out. Okay, what you're seeing here is a fluke process meter. And this will provide what you call loop power. It will actually power up the transmitter and read the 4 to 20 milliamps flowing through it. So we connect this up, and when we connect it up, we'll uh, get on our communicator and we'll set the lower range value. Uh, so we'll bring up our lower range value, we'll set our hand pump to zero PSI, and we'll say 4 milliamps, and we hit enter. And then we put in, we want the full span, 20 milliamps, we'll pump up to 100 PSI, and we'll hit our 20 milliamps span, and that sets our span. So our span would be 0 to 100 PSI, and that's how we calibrate the span. Uh, if your 4 to 20 is off a little bit, you can go into the digital to analog converter, and trim this to make sure it's exactly 4 to 20. Like here we're reading 20.003. We can go into the digital analog converter and we can actually make that 20.000. It is that accurate. Okay. Okay, that's it for pressure. Um, let's take a break and maybe review. Uh, you may want to go back and look at some of this material again. Try to dedicate to memory. Uh, you can always go to the book and look up this information in the test, and we have all the example problems on how to work this, what all the equipment accessories are in the book, so you have a good reference there. Um, so next, we're going to get into level measurement. Okay, now level measurement. Uh, like we said in video two, uh, the first thing we want to talk about is weight and the weight of a fluid. Uh, just like in video six in fluids, we talked about that the atmosphere, uh, air, actually has weight. And if you go up to the top of the atmosphere, it weighs 14.7 pounds at the bottom of the column. Remember, this is pounds per square inch over a one square inch area. And we also showed how as we heat water up, it becomes lighter and lighter and lighter, and the molecules spread out more and more until it goes off into a gas. Well, we're looking at this distillation column here, and we got a supply tank which has the feed, and it may be a, a crude oil, and then we're, we're coming into this distillation column, say we're, we're trying to make gasoline. So we'll bring in our crude oil, and we'll go through a reboiler, and we'll make it boil, and we'll flash off the gasoline, and the gasoline will become a vapor, condense at the top, and come into the tank up by the reflux and it's called the reflux tank. Uh, from this reflux tank, we put part back into the column, and the other part goes to another storage tank. The top products go to a storage tank. So we have to measure the level in the supply tank. We have to measure the level in the reflux tank, and in the bottom of the column, we have to measure how much liquid we have. It'll be the liquid on the bottom that goes through the reboiler, then it flashes and comes up as a vapor. So we have to make three different measurements. Now, in the column, we know we're going to have pressure. It may be 30 PSI. It may be 100 PSI. It depends on the steam and how much uh, energy you're putting into it. On the reflux tank, it's probably going to have some vapor in it too, and we'd have a pressure relief valve up there. So if we got too much pressure, it would relieve it off. Uh, maybe go to a storage tank or vent it off to a flare. 
So let's talk about weight. Uh, the weight of the crude oil will be heavy compared to the weight of the gasoline. So then we bring this crude oil into the distillation column and we start boiling it. As we start boiling it, it becomes lighter and lighter as it gets hot. So as we heat this oil up in the column, uh, it becomes lighter and lighter. Now the problem is we're building up pressure on the top. So this pressure will push down and its PSI will be greater than the PSI due to the weight of the liquid. We have to compensate for this PSI of pressure from the vapor compared to the PSI of the liquid. We only want to know the weight of the liquid in PSI, pounds per square inch. So we have to compensate for the pressure with a differential pressure transmitter. And the top will have the pressure of the column going onto it. And the bottom also feels pressure of the column. But the bottom feels the pressure of the column plus the weight of the liquid. And since it's a differential pressure transmitter, uh, it'll subtract the gas pressure, vapor pressure, from the low side and the high side. Those will cancel out. And all we're left with is the weight of the liquid. And this is how we measure our liquid in a pressurized vessel. Okay, now the high side goes to the bottom because it's got the highest positive pressure. And the low side goes to the top. And normally the low side is vented to atmosphere. But sometimes we'll put in what's called a wet leg or reference leg. And this is what you see coming up on the right side up to the top. It's the wet leg or reference leg. And in this case, it'd be a, some kind of a silicone. Uh, these are called diaphragm seals here. And so these would be called pancakes. You hear them called pancakes, seals, or diaphragms. Uh, sometimes you hear them called waffles. But typically, the industrial terms are a seal or a diaphragm. And really, it's a diaphragm seal. And this is what's repeating the pressure to the silicone which then pushes on the little diaphragm inside the transmitter itself, which has a small diaphragm, and that's how we measure the pressure. These act as repeaters, mechanical repeaters. Okay, uh, you remember from video six, um, fluid mechanics for process control, that we have different size molecules. And uh, these molecules are just moving around. And so when we bring our crude oil in, and we want to separate this crude oil into uh, different uh, elements. So here, if we look at the bottom, we have uh, residue, which would be like asphalt on roads. Then we have fuel oil, lubricating oil, like you put into your motor in your car. We have diesel, which would be diesel fuel that goes into trucks. We have kerosene that we use to burn in lanterns and furnaces and jet engines that uses some kind of jet fuel. Uh, and then we have our petro at the top, which is our gasoline. And then we have our bottled gases and our refinery gas that we use to burn, uh, say, to create steam or other processes. So these big molecules are at the bottom and little molecules are at the top. So the big molecules have a lot more energy. So we have to put a lot more heat into it to break these molecules apart. Uh, when we're at the top, like the gasoline, it doesn't take as much energy to break the molecule apart because it's already small and it doesn't hold as much energy. So you notice our temperature starts at the bottom at 600 C. So our fuel oil would be like uh, 370 to 600 C, while gasoline is only 40 C to 205 C. So our temperature doesn't have to be as high as we go up. Um, and like we said, these columns are pressurized. And when we come off these different products, they're called side draws. So if we bring these side draws off, we're going to store them in a level tank to pump them out. And they'll actually circulate back in, just like the smaller diagram before. They'll recirculate back in as what's called reflux to control the column. So as we control these level tanks, we can't just put a, a level transmitter on there, say 50 inches uh, for each one. Each one weighs different. So each transmitter will have to be calibrated different based on its specific gravity. So you remember from fluids, we said specific gravity is the ratio of a liquid to water at 60 degrees. And gas 
and specific gravity is the ratio of a gas or vapor to air at 60 degrees. And so the specific gravity sets our weight. Remember our molecules, these are molecules move around, and we have density, which is mass per unit volume, and we take our mass times acceleration of gravity, and we get force per unit volume, and so this is weight per volume, and we call this density. And so water would be like 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. And so we take like our crude oil per cubic foot over water or gasoline per cubic foot over water. And this ratio is called its specific gravity. And this is how we adjust our water column when we calibrate these transmitters to measure the height. Because if we're looking at motor gasoline and it had a specific gravity of 0.79, that means that it weighs 79% of the weight of water. In other words, it's 21% lighter than the weight of water. And so uh, we'd have to calibrate with less inches of water in the transmitter to be able to measure this height. So in other words, when we'd be measuring 100 inches of water to get our height of 100 inches, we'd only measure 79 inches of water to measure 100 inches of gasoline. So I want to reemphasize this. It's very important in level measurement. So in other words, when we'd be measuring 100 inches of water to get our height of 100 inches, we'd only measure 79 inches of water to measure 100 inches of gasoline. Because it's lighter, it doesn't have as much weight, so we put in less inches of water to get the same height in the level. And this is important when understanding the specific gravity. And so this varies with the molecular structure, whatever uh, product we're using. And it also varies with temperature. Uh, your temperature, as you see here in gasoline, may, may vary from 0.71 to 0.79. And this depends on the molecular makeup as well as the temperature. As it cools down, it'll become heavier. And as it heats up, it becomes lighter. Because your molecules spread out as it heats up, Therefore, you have less weight per square inch. Therefore, we have less PSI per square inch. And remember, our inches of water is measuring our weight per square inch or pounds per square inch of weight. Okay, this is very important. In summary, when we're measuring pressure uh, in a vessel or a pipe, it's just molecules pounding against the side producing PSI. But when we're doing level measurements and flow measurements, we're actually weighing the fluid and this weight of the molecules and mass per cubic foot, cubic inch, in this case the mass over one square inch, we're measuring the weight over the one square inch area as a column and we reference this to a column of water so everything is calibrated in a column of water. If it's lighter we use less inches of water, if it's heavier than water we use more inches of water so we get an equivalent height that produces an equivalent height, whether it's lighter than water or heavier than water, we want to get the actual height. So gasoline would be a smaller column because it's lighter, and something like asphalt or the silicone fill uh, would have a specific gravity of 1.1, so it'd be a taller column of water. Now when we're calibrating, that doesn't mean we have to use water, because remember, PSI is PSI. So we can just use uh, plant air or nitrogen or some kind of a gas and as long as we dial up the PSI in inches of water, remember inches of water on a gauge, doesn't matter if it's PSI or inches of water, pressure is pressure. So when we're calibrating the transmitter, we can use water or we can use gas as long as we produce the measurement in water column of PSI. Remember. 27.7 inches of water equals 1 psi or 2.31 feet equals 1 psi and this is called hydrostatic pressure. Okay, let's actually do some level measurements now. Now on the exam uh, they're not going to ask you to calculate the level with different instruments except for typically head type devices and so you may do a displacer but typically you're going to look at what is the span or what is the calibrated span of a head type level measurement, a differential pressure transmitter,
or uh, doing a pressurized vessel or just the low side vented atmosphere measuring the level in an atmospheric vented tank and this will be about all you have on your exam. Now when we're making a level measurements using head pressure we won't use an inline transmitter like you saw earlier. We'll use what you're seeing right up here. Uh, the one on the left if it was a rose monitor be called an LT and this is a diaphragm transmitter and it just bolts up to a flange on the bottom of the tank. Now this tank will have to be vented to atmosphere because our low side is vented to atmosphere. That way we have the same differential pressure. The one on the right uh, is a differential pressure transmitter just like you see on the left except we have diaphragms on it that are connected with capillary tubes and we take this and we put it on a flange at the top and a flange at the bottom and this is for measuring a differential pressure across the tank where it's pressurized just like we talked about we can measure the level with this uh, it's also used like on the column where we want to see the differential pressure across the column and know what that pressure is to see if we're flooding or choking inside the column uh, and this will tell what's happening and these will be attached in an area where there's no liquid it's strictly clear vapor a clear space with vapor okay what we're seeing here is how to use a differential pressure transmitter uh, the first one to the left is called a tuned system and this tuned system uh, basically is an LT with one capillary coming up then we have a balance system is the transmitter we were just looking at it has a diaphragm at the bottom and a diaphragm at the top and this uses capillary tubes then we have a wet leg now this is like we saw earlier when we we're talking about the manifold it actually has piping tubes coming to it uh, some still call them impulse lines but basically impulse lines are used in flow measurement so we use a differential to make flow but we use the differential with tubes to make level measurements as well and this leg going to the top is called the wet leg or the reference leg. Now this last one it's exactly the same thing except it's what they call a dry leg. There's no fluid in there. So the wet leg we may fill with water, a processed fluid, glycol. We'll use that as our reference leg but on a dry leg it is just the pressure comes down to the transmitter and it's not pushing against the fluid in that tube. Now with the dry leg, uh, you may have like a nitrogen blanket, so there's no need to fill up the wet leg. Uh, this wet leg is so when the atmosphere has vapor in it and it condensates, it fills up with liquid and that'll throw off our measurement. But if we just have nitrogen in the line, uh, there's no condensation and that tube will never fill up with any kind of condensate to cause an error in the measurement. Now if you look at all these drawings, uh, notice that with a level measurement your transmitter always has to be below the lowest point that you're trying to measure in the level. Uh, you, you can have head above the transmitter but you can't have head below the transmitter and measure it because you have to raise that head up and get it at the transmitter before it can push pressure against it. So it's not going to measure below the transmitter it will only measure pressure above the transmitter if you go below this silicone fill in these capillaries will actually suck or pull down on the transmitter and you actually get a negative reading you can't measure below the transmitter both taps what they call the tap where you go into the tank and you connect on these piping flanges some chemical will call it nozzles on these so when you connect on these piping taps or these nozzles you always have to be above your transmitter to measure that level. The tank always has to be above the transmitter to measure the level. You can go as low as you want below it, but you can't go above the lowest level you want to measure. So what you're seeing on the left here is uh, a Rosemont LT transmitter and this is a coplanar transmitter. There's two diaphragms on the bottom and one is connected to the diaphragm that bolts up to the tank at the bottom. The transmitter will go on to the bottom and that is the high side of the transmitter. 
and the capillary tube diaphragm goes to the top of the tank and what's unique about this is you can get your remote head and plug into this and that way since your transmitter is bolted to the flange at the bottom of the tank you don't want to lean down and look at that all the time so you put your post out there and you put the remote head up so that the process operator or technician or engineer can walk up and actually see what the level is. All right, this differential pressure transmitter is just what it says, a difference transmitter. So it measures the difference of the high side and the low side. So that's high side plus a minus low side. The low side looks like minus inches of water and the high side looks like positive inches of water. So here we're trying to measure 0 to 100 inches in the tank. So when it's empty and we take this transmitter off the shelf and we calibrate 0, our balance beam is at 0. There's uh, Both sides are equal. And we move this fulcrum <clears throat> until both sides are equal. Because we're putting force. It's not just pressure. We're putting weight on both sides to push in these diaphragms. So if we got more weight on one side than the other, that means we're getting a signal out. When the diaphragm's straight across, it's at zero, and we've got zero process signal. So when we add our water in our tank, you'll see the high side puts weight on it, and it goes down. And at maximum height, we got 100% output. So we're trying to get at 0% 4 milliamps, and at 100% 20 milliamps. So like we said, the formula is the high side of the transmitter minus the low side of the transmitter. And the bottom value, zero, is the lower range value. You remember from our terminology, lower range value is the lower calibrated point on the range that equals zero percent. And 100 inches will be our upper range value. And that will be the highest calibrated point that equals 100 percent on the range. Well, in example one, we'll see the tank is vented to atmosphere. And we see the low side of the vented to atmosphere. That means that they cancel each other out and there's no pressure being applied to L. Because what's being applied by atmosphere is being applied to the water, so they're subtracted, right? So all we're left with is the weight of the water in the tank. And it has a specific gravity of one, so it, it's probably water. So remember, our formula is the high side minus the low side. So the lower range value would be zero times the specific gravity of one, that's the high side, minus, minus the low side, which is zero with the specific gravity of one. Specific gravity doesn't matter because it's zero height. And that equals zero inches, which is four milliamps. Now the upper range value will have 100 inches of water in the tank. And the low side has zero inches on it, so it becomes upper range value is 100 inches times the specific gravity of 1 minus zero inches, the low side, times the specific gravity of 1, equals 100 inches, which equals 20 milliamps. So this transmitter would be calibrated from zero to 100 inches, H2O. Now the calibration goes from the lower range to the upper range when you specify it. Okay, on the second one here, example two, we'll see the transmitters below the tank. So that line's gonna be full of liquid, in this case, water. So if we look at the teeter-totter, we see we want 0% out and our teeter-totter has to be level. So we adjust the fulcrum, our calibration zero, until this little bit of water, 20 inches, cancels out in the transmitter with an offset and we have 0% or 4 milliamps. Uh, now we add the water into the tank and it rises above the 20 inches and we're going up to 100 inches. So to the transmitter that is 120 inches but we've taken away the 20 inches and so what we got is 120. We calibrated here from 20 to 120 inches. Uh, so what you see here is the lower range value is the high side minus the low side. So here our high side has 20 inches times the specific gravity of 1 minus a low side of 0 inches. It's the atmosphere. 
So that equals 20 inches, which equals 4 milliamps. Now the upper range value is 120 inches above the transmitter on the high side times the Pacific Gravity 1 minus 0 inches on the low side which equals 120 inches which equals 20 milliamps or 100 percent. So the calibrated range on this transmitter would be 20 inches lower range value to 120 inches upper range value of H2O or water. Now notice, both of these tanks go from 0 to 100 inches. We're measuring 0 to 100 inches. So even though our calibrated range is from 20 to 120 on example 2, it has the exact same span. So obviously all you have to do is take your upper range value minus your lower range value will equal your span. And you just subtract, even if it's negative, you'll subtract it. So that would be a positive and it will give you a positive number. Okay, let's go to the next example. So in these two examples, example three and four, we have a pressurized tank and it doesn't matter if it's got 14 inches like a, a nitrogen blanket or if it's got 100 psi. Uh, they'll cancel out, the pressure of the tank will cancel out across the pressure gauge because it's high side minus low side. Remember this is a differential pressure transmitter. So when we apply a pressure to the tank on the top, it applies it to the wet leg on the low side and to the water it's pushing on the high side. So you have the same pressure on each side of the transmitter and that pressure of the blanket or the pressure inside the tank will cancel out. All the transmitter will see is the weight of the water or the fill fluid in the wet leg on the low side and the weight of the process fluid in the tank and it'll measure the difference of the process fluid and the reference leg or wet leg. The pressure inside the tank will cancel out. So here our wet leg has specific gravity of 1.1. We filled it up with something and uh, we're going up 100 inches. Now normally you wouldn't take your level up to the wet leg. You would stop below the wet leg, maybe 10 inches below the wet leg. But as you can see, uh, we have to cancel out this wet leg and when our tank is empty all of our weight is on the negative side. So on the negative side we have all this weight and when we fill up the tank with water uh, it's going to be less weight than what the specific gravity of 1.1 in the wet leg exerts. So uh, let's do our calibration. So our lower range value will be the high side minus the low side. So we got zero inches in the tank on the high side times the Pacific gravity of one minus 100 inches on the low side, the wet leg, times the Pacific gravity of 1.1. So this equals minus 110 inches. So minus 110 inches equals our four milliamps. Now when we fill up the tank, that's our upper range value, 100%. And we're trying to reach 100 inches here. So our high side will have 100 inches of water on it times the Pacific gravity of 1 minus the low side, which is 100 inches times the Pacific gravity of 1.1, the fill fluid. Therefore, we get minus 10 inches. And minus 10 inches equals 100% or 20 milliamps. So the calibrated range of this transmitter it'd be calibrated from minus 110 inches to minus 10 inches H2O. Now you'll see you got a 100 inch span here. Uh, just like we said before, you take the upper range value minus the lower range value. So that'd be minus 10 inches minus a minus 110 inches. So that makes it minus 10 plus 110 equals 100 inches. So our span is still 100 inches. Okay, here in example four, we'll see it's almost like example two, except we got a wet leg or a reference leg. Now, if you look on the right-hand side of example four, you'll see the transmitter is 20 inches below the tank. But notice in the tank, it has a specific gravity of 0.8. So that means the fluid is only 80% of the weight. 
Therefore, we would take 80% of 20 inches and we would get 16 inches. Remember, this is 80% of the weight of water. And our height is directly proportional to our weight in pounds per square inch. So if we have a specific gravity of 80%, that means we have 80% of the height of water. Therefore, the 20 inches becomes 16 inches to the transmitter. So what we see is that this transmitter has plus 16 inches above it on the high side. This is at 0%. We have 16 inches above it on the high side, but on the wet leg side, the reference leg side, on the low side, we have the 100 inches plus the 20 inches below for 120 inches. And then we have to multiply that times the specific gravity of 1.1. So we get a total pressure on the low side of minus 132 inches. Remember, that's 100 plus 20 is 120. Multiply times your specific gravity of the wet leg gives us minus 132 inches on the wet leg. Now, on the high leg, when the tank's full, we have 120 inches total from the transmitter to the top. And so that'll be 120 inches times the specific gravity of 0.8. So we get a total of 96 inches. The high side of the transmitter, when the tank is full, we'll only see 96 inches of weight, the pressure pushing against it, because it's 80% of the weight of water, so it's lighter. Okay, so we can see from our teeter-totter, we have our low side and our high side. We have to get 0% out, so we make sure we calibrate the zero, and in this case here, what we have to do is we have to elevate the zero if it's an older transmitter, because we won't get 100% out. We'll get maybe 80% out or 70% out of our current because we're so negative. And so we'll actually take a jumper or in the switch of the software, we'll set it to elevate zero. And this will give us the proper current. You notice we're below zero. So we have to elevate the 132 up to zero. And that'll give us our 100 inch span. Okay, let's do the calculation because this one's a little confusing. So our lower range value is 20 inches, we're 20 inches below the tap of the tank, times 0.8, so we have 20 inches of process fluid in there, so that's 20 times 0.8, minus 120 inches on the wet leg, times the specific gravity of 1.1, and that will give us minus 116 inches, or 4 milliamps, which would be 0%. That's our lower range value. Now, when we fill up the tank, we just do our calculation. Keep it simple. Upper range value is 120 inches times 0.8, the specific gravity of the process fluid, minus 120 inches on the wet leg times the specific gravity of 1.1 equals minus 36 inches. And that would be 100% or 20 milliamps, and that's your upper range value. So again, the calibration of this transmitter will be, it's calibrated from minus 116 inches to minus 36 inches H2O. Okay, remember we said our span is our upper range value minus our lower range value. So that'll be minus 36 minus a minus 116, which becomes minus 36 plus 116, which equals 80 inches. And you say, wait a minute, uh, this is supposed to be 100 inches. We're trying to measure 100 inches in this tank. Well, we are measuring 100 inches in the control room when we use the engineering values. When we scale this in engineering values on display and the computer, we get 100 inches. But to the transmitter, the transmitter only sees 80 inches. Okay, so that'll be 96 inches minus 16 inches is 80 inches because our fluid was 120 times the specific gravity of 0.8 gave us 96. And remember, we never get below the 20 inches on the bottom, which to the transmitter is 16 inches. So that's 96 inches at 100% minus 16 inches at 
at 0% is 80 inches. So the 100 inches, 100 times 0.8 is 80. Again, our calibrated range is minus 116 inches to minus 36 inches. Upper range value, minus 36, minus the lower range value, minus 116, gives us 80 positive inches of span on the transmitter. And that 80 inches will be our 4 to 20 milliamps or 0 to 100 process signal into the PLC, DCS, and then we scale that on the engineering display as 100 inches in the tank. Now on a note, don't forget your basic math rules. When you subtract a negative number, it becomes positive. So when you're subtracting a negative number, just change it to a positive number and just add the numbers together. Okay. Okay, uh, we can do the same thing and do density, find out our density. Uh, we can find interface levels of what between water and a process fluid and how much water is in there and how much process fluid. And we show how to calculate this in the book in detail. Uh, we expand on and explain quite a bit about it, but there's no use going into it on the video. Just get the book and read it. By now you should understand how this works. Okay, don't forget. So remember, if your transmitter is below the tank without a wet leg, that means that you've got extra pressure above the transmitter and so your live zero is above zero and will suppress it. So you'll take the jumper in an old transmitter and you'll put it to suppress zero. But if it's got a wet leg, that means you actually got a negative measurement, a large negative measurement. And so you're going to have to bring that, in this case, minus 132 up to zero. So we'll set this jumper to elevate to zero. Uh, if you're just a little above or below, you can leave it on normal zero and it'll work. Uh, there may be some questions on this on the exam, so be sure you understand what elevate zero, suppress zero, and normal zero are in transmitters. Okay. Okay, let's talk about wet legs for a minute. Uh, here we see a wet leg, and one is a seal. We've already talked about that. And typically, it'll have like a silicon fill. Uh, we don't have to worry about that. But in this tank here where we got this gas, and it's got a condensable vapor, uh, the vapor will condense and come down the wet leg. Okay, well, if our wet leg changes height, of course, we've lost our calibration. We don't know what height we got inside the tank. So we have to keep this wet leg filled. So you always have to have a fill valve so you can fill that wet leg up. Now, the problem with this type is, depending on what the um, liquid is you fill it up with, it may evaporate over time, which will give you an error in your level measurement. So typically, we put in this, a seal pot, and typically, they're going to put in glycol, and they'll put glycol in the seal pot, and it'll keep the pipe filled up. And notice at the bottom, we got a drain. So for maintenance, we can always drain our wet leg and then refill it later. And so this is the best way to go. Notice the three valve manifold in the impulse tubes going to the taps. Uh, as we showed before, you can have it directly on the transmitter or you can just put it into the tubes. Now, once you block these, don't forget, you can calibrate these transmitters in place by going through the drain vent in the back. Uh, you have to drain these out to get the air out of the transmitter when you first uh, install these. Uh, but if you get a 5-valve manifold, you can calibrate through the vent of the 5-valve manifold. Okay, another handy type head level measurement is uh, the bubbler tube. Uh, so the bubbler tube is what you're seeing here. It's a quarter inch diameter dip tube. They call it a dip tube that goes down into the tank. And it's off the bottom, say maybe an inch or so. Uh, and then what it is, is you have an air supply or nitrogen, and this is really high pressure in the plant or the bottle. So we have to use a pressure regulator to reduce the pressure. And the pressure out of the pressure regulator will be higher than the height of the tank in inches of water and PSI. So you may have an inches of water regulator. So say you want to measure up 100 inches of height in the tank, then you'd use like 150 or 200 inches on the pressure regulator.
Okay. Now, next you have what's called a rotometer, and this is actually a manual flow control, and it has a little ball right in the middle, and as you move this handle, uh, it adjusts the flow rate, and the ball floats up telling you how many standard cubic feet per hour or cubic feet per minute you're putting in. So we would set a flow rate out of this tube, and it start bubbling through the water. Now, the pressure transmitter will be calibrated just like a normal level transmitter. It's actually a level transmitter, and it'll be calibrated in zero to say 100 inches of water. So it'll be calibrated in zero to 100 inches of water. Now, what it is is when there's no water in the tank, the air just flows out. And we know at the end of the pipe, we have zero PSI when we come to atmosphere. So if you put your thumb over the end of the tube, you'd notice the pressure would build up. And then you take your thumb away a little bit and the pressure drops. Put your thumb against it tighter and the pressure builds up. This is the same principle of how an I to P on a control valve works. Uh, you just have a flapper. That'd be your thumb. But in this case, instead of using a flapper, we use uh, the water. And the water puts a pressure against the end, and it puts a back pressure towards the transmitter. So the transmitter is only going to see the back pressure of the water. Just like if you put your thumb on it and kept increasing and increasing and then backed it off, uh, that pressure on that transmitter, same as a pressure gauge, would register a pressure up and down. Well, this pressure is going to be exactly equal to the inches of water. Remember, this is water has weight, and so it's creating a back pressure, a force against it, and this air has to overcome that force. Well, how much force does it have to overcome? The weight of the water. And we know that the weight of the water is directly proportional to the inches of height. So this level transmitter will measure the inches of water in back pressure against it. The only pressure it's going to see, it won't see the pressure out of the line because when it's empty, it has zero PSI or zero inches of water coming out of the end of the line. So it'll only see the back pressure of how many inches of water you have in the tank. And so if we want 100 inches, we calibrate our transmitter zero to 100. And as we fill this up, it will actually measure zero to 100 inches of water. Now, don't forget specific gravity. If this is a petrochemical product and it has a specific gravity of 0.85, that means instead of 0 to 100 inches of water, we would calibrate 0 to 85 inches of water and the signal would be 0 to 100 percent equals 0 to 100 inches in the tank. Even though the transmitter is seeing 85 inches of the petrochemical product, that is 85% of the weight of water. So you actually get a signal broadcast 100% that equals 100 inches. Okay. Okay. Uh, so how do we calibrate this level transmitter? Well, uh, the first question you may have is how do I know what is the high and the low side? Well, if you look at this right here, you'll see that it's actually forged into the transmitter. You have an H for the high side and an L for the low side. And here we have a three valve manifold. And the three valve manifold, you can see that uh, we have a drain in the side. And so you open up this drain, this drain breather, you unscrew it and you screw in there. And that's where you actually do your calibration. Now, notice this is a coplanar because the tubes would connect to the bottom where these white uh, fittings are. This is where your tube would normally come in. Now here we're seeing a biplanar because it comes in horizontally and all we have to do is take our vents out of the back and we can plug in there with our our pressure pump and we can pump this up to the pressure we want. Okay so to calibrate this um, last time on pressure we went 0 to 100 psi. So you'd have to have a a pump with a pressure gauge that indicates inches of water instead of PSI. So before, if we wanted 0 to 100 PSI, we just bent it to 0, set our 4, we pumped in 100 PSI, and we hit our 20 milliamps. We're doing the same thing on level. 
except uh, here, let's use example two. We wanted to go from 20 to 120 inches of water. So again, we set our pressure gauge to 120, or we would get a gauge that does inches of water. And we would put it on the high side, and we would pump up 20 inches, and we hit our lower range value, 4 milliamps in the span, and then we would pump up 120 inches, and we'd hit our upper range value, 20 milliamps in the span. And this is what gives us our span of 100 inches. But if we look at example four, we've got minus 116 inches to minus 36 inches. You say, how do I put in minus inches? Well, so here you'd vent the high side to atmosphere, and you would take out the plug for the low side, and you plug your pressure pump into that. And you pump up your pressure until you get to uh, 116 inches. Now remember, 116 inches is your lower range value, and we're on the negative side. So when we pump up to 116 inches on the low side, that's minus 116 inches. And we select our lower range value, and we put in 4 milliamps. Then we vent it off, and then we pump it back up to 36 inches on the low side. And then we hit our upper range value, 20 milliamps for the span. And this is what will give you your span of positive 80 inches. Uh, the transmitter on the 3051, it'll handle this by itself and give you the positive 80. But if you're using a, like a Rosemont 1151, you actually have to go into the back and take the jumper off and put it on elevate zero. Okay, that's about it for calibration for level. So this is a good time to take a break, um, relax a little bit or review, and uh, we've probably got about 15-20 minutes left time to cover the different level devices. And that'll be the end of this module, and then we'll move on to more instrumentation. Uh, let's look at some other level type devices. Uh, we'll look at radar, gamma, uh, displacers, and there's all kinds, ultrasonic and we're going to look at these very quickly and just glance over what it is. Uh, the manufacturer will show you how to calibrate these per their instructions. But let's compare level measurement devices and see what's available. Okay, in this picture here, uh, it basically shows most level technologies. Now, we can either measure the level or we can have what's called a, a set point. And when we reach a certain level, it'll switch. Uh, so if we look at these uh, transmitters and level measuring devices from left to right, uh, on the left is solids, say sand, flour, uh, and on the right would be a liquid. And it could be oil, gas, water. And uh, so looking at the left and working our way around, we have an RF switch. And the RF switch, uh, it has basically a piezoelectric circuit or some kind of oscillating circuit and it sends out a high frequency into the rod, which has capacitance. And when the material touches the rod, uh, the capacitance changes, and therefore the voltage across the measuring circuit will change. So this is a point level, or a switch. This is a point level switch. It, it just, when the material touches it, it switches off and on. That's all it does. Uh, it looks straight across from that onto the right and you'll see a vibrating fork. And this has uh, a generator that sends out a frequency that causes it to oscillate at a natural frequency. And as the material comes up around these forks, it's actually a tuning fork. We're driving a tuning fork, just like striking one and tuning a guitar. It's vibrating, going boom. And when the material touches it, it stops vibrating, and it can sense that vibration stop by a reflection, and it switches, and again, this is a point level switch. The one right above that one is called a paddle wheel. If we look at this paddle wheel, it's uh, just like you see uh, a paddle wheel that spins on the back of a boat or a paddle wheel that, that's pushing water. It just spins around and it has a synchronous motor and the synchronous motor assembly is attached with a spring. And so when the material comes up to the paddle wheel, the paddle wheel can't spin and since it's producing a torque, 
uh, it twists inside against the spring and flips the switch, letting you know that you're full. Again, this is a point level uh, switch. The one right above that to the right is called a plumb bob. And this can be used in water or it can be used in solids. Uh, just like the RF switch and the vibrating fork, they can be used in water as well. They can be used in a liquid. But the paddle switch isn't going to work in water or it's kind of liquid because it'll just keep spinning. It won't have enough force to stop it. The plumb bob is basically a servo mechanism. And uh, when the material pushes against the plumb bob, it has a certain amount of buoyance and the servo uh, keeps the string tight. In other words, if it raises up, it tries to relax the string and the servo senses this and keeps this tight. And using an encoder or gear mechanisms, we can tell what the height of the level is. And so the plumb bob will actually transmit a level and it'll let you know what the level is. Now, notice at the bottom how the hook just kind of hooks on the cable. Sometimes you use a chain. But the problem is, if you're doing this in a tank that has a volatile fluid and there's a lot of vapor, uh, you need to put a jumper between the cable and the actual metal float, the bob, uh, because it can jerk. And as you fill up these tanks, you get a separation of charge. And so you develop a charge across the tank in the liquid. And if it jerks, it could cause a spark as it tries to equalize potential of charge and it'll blow up and it'll ignite the vapors in the tank. Uh, complete tank farms have been wiped out because of this. So be sure to put a jumper between your cable and your plumb ball before you install it. Next to that is a laser. And lasers are typically only used in uh, solids. So you shoot a beam down, it bounces off, and it's the time of flight, the time it takes light to travel and come back. Light is an electromagnetic field, and it has a time of flight. It goes down, bounces, and comes back. And we can sense this and measure this. Next to that is ultrasonic. And ultrasonic uh, can be used in water, solids, or liquids. It sends out an ultra-high frequency sound wave of about 40 to 400 kilohertz and the ear can only detect up to 20 kilohertz, so you can't hear this. It hits the material and bounces back. And again, it's time of flight. We just measure how long it takes to get there and back, and we know how far away the fluid is. The shorter the time, the closer it is. And we can calibrate our circuitry accordingly and uh, send out a 4 to 20, and this will detect a level. Now, radar, there's two different types of radar. Uh, one is a horn, and similar to the ultrasonic, it sends out electromagnetic frequency, it hits the material, bounces off, comes back, and this is the time of flight. So the wave going out is called the incident wave, and the wave coming back is called the reflected wave. Now, if we want to get a better measurement, and this is what most people use, we can either use a rod or what they call a rope, uh, a flexible cable wire going down, and it'll send the electric magnetic field down through the wire. And when it hits the surface, it can tell there's a difference in density and a change in impedance due to the dielectric constant of the fluid you're being, that's being measured. And so we get a reflected signal back. So when it reflects back, time of flight of how long it takes to come back, uh, this tells us how far down it is from our sensor. Now on a note, the ultrasonic and the horn type radar are non-contact type level measurements, while the probes and the set points are contact type measurements. And you may have questions on what's non-contact and what's contact. So remember this. Now on the blue level tank, we have a couple things we didn't have in the solids. Uh, for one thing, we can use uh, thermal dispersion. Uh, thermal dispersion is has a space between two little rods. One is a heater and one's an RTD. When you get a flow between it, it conducts the thermal energy to the RTD, letting you know you have a, again, it's a set point level. And again, we have uh, a float switch. So uh, we can use a float switch, and this float switch will actually raise a displacer with a level, 
and it'll push a switch, a magnetic switch or a mechanical switch. Um, now notice we have an RF transmitter and this RF transmitter works like the RF switch except as you get more liquid around the rod uh, you change the capacitance which is constantly changing the voltage and so you get a voltage that produces a 4 to 20 milliamp current out that's proportional to the level. Now a capacitance probe it sets up a voltage between the tank and the rod and this voltage would be proportional to the level. Uh, as you put liquid in there, you get more capacitance, more capacitance, more capacitance. So you store more voltage, store more voltage, and store more voltage. And this works fairly well for liquids. In liquids, it doesn't matter what the shape of the tank is, but if you get into a solid, it matters, and your dielectric constant changes with the shape of the tank, and it's not a very accurate measurement for solids. A capacitance probe isn't well suited for uh, a tank that has a composition that's constantly changing either. So you're better off to go with radar, even though it's more expensive. Uh, the last one is a magnetorestrictive, and this is a magnetorestrictive level measurement. So the displacer has a magnet in it, and the transmitter sends down uh, a current pulse, which sets up a current. So these are competing magnetic fields, and as they meet, uh, they have a torsion, just like a motor tries to twist. It tries to create a torsion in the rod, and this torsion creates a, a sound wave that travels back up the rod. So again, it is time of flight, and we can know where the level is by how long it took for this sound wave to travel back up the rod. Uh, the last thing we have is a magnetic level gauge. And what this is, it has a, typically has a lot of flaps. Um, as you go up through there, you have a flap that flips over, flips over, flips over, flips over. And they typically go uh, black on the top and red on the bottom. So as a, a displacer raises up inside this magnetic tube, uh, it has a magnet. And these flaps turn over and become red. So as it raises up, as it keeps going up, the flaps keep turning red, turning red, turning red, turning red. And this is a good visual indication of what your level is. And then as it comes down, they flip back over black, 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 black. So you get a red on the bottom for your level and a black on the top that's open space. And these are used a lot in process control. Now, the one you see here in the picture, it actually has a transmitter, and it's actually sending out a level. Not only is it showing an indication of level, but it's sending out a level signal with a 4 to 20. Um, so some will have a transmitter, and some are strictly just a visual indication so the operator can see what the level is in the tank. Okay, something not shown here is called a gamma level. And what it is, is used in solids. And it's a gamma radiation emitter. And it'll have a pickup unit on the other side. And it'll kind of look like a long, similar to this magnetic level switch you're seeing, except it has cells that picks up the radiation and produces a voltage that is then sent and this is typically used in like catalyst or some kind of a, a vessel where you can't see inside now these are also called radiometric and nuclear level switches or level detectors and these do have an analog output but uh, you, if you're sending out a 4 to 20 current from your transmitter uh, it's very nonlinear and you're going to need like an, or what they call an 8 or 16 segment curve. And you have to calibrate this and program a curve and linearize your output. Okay, uh, something else is, notice on this magnetorestricto, uh, on the left side of the blue tank, this is called an interface level. The top is probably uh, like a petrochemical product and the bottom would be water. And so we have a bigger displacer on the bottom than we do on the top. Notice there's two displacers, two bulbs. And so the bigger one will be displaced by the water, and the smaller one will be displaced by the lighter petrochemical product. Now, interface level can also be accomplished by using a displacer. We can use a displacer like this float switch that will send to a transmitter. We can use radar with a probe or some kind of a waveguide like a cable and get our interface levels. Uh, we can also use what you're seeing here. We can use a differential transmitter and you can actually calculate this interface. And it's not that complicated to calculate how to get this interface.
and we show how to do that in a book. Uh, you probably won't have it on the test, but you'll probably run into it, so you may want to be aware of it. Uh, I think that's good enough. If you um, want to watch more on instrumentation and level transmitters, uh, you can get on YouTube and go to BTC Instrumentation, and this is a Canadian college, and he teaches a lot about instrumentation. Uh, he'll show you how the different little instruments work and how to connect them and how they wire. Um, and we have quite a bit of information in the book as well. So I think this is it. Let's move on and get the flow, weight, and analyzers. So I'll see you in the next video. Bye.